We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hi, welcome. My name's Michael Jacoby Brown, and I'm your host with uh, We Hold These Truths. And today we're very lucky to have Alan Levy, the author of a new book, thriving in public schools and alan and two of his colleagues will be here on the show today so welcome we're really honored to have you alan and could you tell us something about your background i know you've been teaching and organizing for many years but where did your values come from and you know where you grew up and uh, what led you to be interested in justice and working for justice you know I actually grew up in Western Pennsylvania. My father was a steel worker, union steel worker. And my mother was a homemaker at the time. And they were very progressive. It was during an era where uh, there was a tremendous struggle for civil rights, which they were involved in. They were both socialists hmm. and they were pursued by the FBI. So at an early age, I kind of got a look at the system. Uh, we talked about social justice, what was fair and what was equitable, and we looked at the system. Um, so that those were the roots. But as I grew, I didn't go straight into teaching. I became a worker. I worked as a machinist. I worked as a structural steel worker, and I worked as a. Uh, I became an organizer, Wisconsin Action Coalition, hmm. which was a, a public interest group, and I did that for a number of years. Uh, maybe 15 years or so. Wow. And then at, at 32, I decided I wanted to teach. Hmm. And I thought I had learned quite a bit as a youth. And I could, I could actually help other people, help young people learn some of the things that, that I knew. So I went into social studies teaching. You know, when I got to, to the school at Horlick High School, I had, spoke, I had taught in the prisons for five years. Um, I had taught at adult school for, for the same five years, uh, like a technical school, I taught history. But when I got to the high school, I began to really take a look at how the, it was structured. And it was clear that the same hierarchy that existed in the larger society existed in the school system. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't fair, it wasn't equitable. And the people who were at the bottom were the working class in general and it was working class uh, Latino and African-American students who were at the bottom of the hierarchy. So that kind of got me very interested in using my organizing skills in teaching to change that dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, along with those students, the teachers were also, at the, they were just a step up, a ring up on the hierarchy within the schools. Both of those groups had very little power within the system. So I thought, if we're going to change the system, they need to gain power. So I spent close to 19 years 
right. helping students and teachers gain power. And what this book is really about is are those experiences and the successes in doing that and uh, changing the culture of the school, changing the dynamics within the community. Um, so that's what I'm sharing. It's part memoir and it's part instructional. Right. And what led you to go into teaching after so many years of working and organizing in Wisconsin? Oh, it's really, that's, that's a really, that's a basic question, which requires a basic answer. Okay. <laughs> I had worked all those years and I made very little money. As an organizer, my top salary was $16,000. All right, so I said, you know, I have, I have three kids. I need to earn a decent living. And what's an honorable thing I can do? So I thought, well, I'm gonna to go to college. I'm gonna become a teacher and I'll get a pension and I'll be able to do some good at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you, after working for many years, you went to college? Exactly. I right. started the university at 32. Uh huh. So what was it like? Can you tell me a little bit more about the details of the class structure that you observed? This was in Racine, Wisconsin. Well, the class structure is the, within the school or within the society? Well, in the school, yeah. Oh, well, basically, um, okay, so the hierarchy of the school is the principals are at the top of the hierarchy within the, the school. Of course, there are middle management and there's a superintendent and the school board and so on that says policy, but they were at the top. And then you had the assistant principals or the associate principals. And then underneath them were the teachers. Then you had mostly students from elite families, the middle, the upper middle class families were next on the hierarchy. And it was evidenced by when you would look at all of the advanced placement classes there would be very, very few working class uh, minority or white students who were part of that. And the kids who, who would be in theater and drama and things that led to scholarships, they were, they were from that upper middle class background or middle class. And then below them were white working class and then Latino and African-American students. Right, so tell me what you actually were, uh, did. Uh, I mean, I know this is in your book, but uh, it would be helpful to explain it briefly on in this session. Uh, what, what you actually did and what were the challenges of working to try to change that system in the high school in Racine? Okay, well, it's in the book and I'll try to capsulize it. But right. basically it started with, the first thing I did was build relationships uh -huh. with students, with teachers, with faculty. Um, I learned my trade teaching because I was a new teacher. Then I became active in the union. I became a rep in the, in the union president. Uh, and at the same time, I started to listen to the kids and try to build in their, their power. And the way I did this was I would, um, I would involve them in doing things like uh, having good programs, like for African-American history, we would do a big assemblies and big after-school activities, which I would have them run or have them organize and, and facilitate and carry it out. The same thing with a Latino. Um, in the classrooms, uh, I taught from a working class perspective. Um, you know, many of the truths of Howard Zinn uh, and others uh, we looked at their history and tried to figure out why things were the way they were uh, and then brought it to life within the community. Right. Uh, worked and, on their issues. Right. And I know you had some challenges uh, within that, that uh, not everybody thought this was your job or the greatest thing that you should be doing. What, were the, what are the challenges and how did you get around them? Or if you want to well, Tell it was one at a time. The challenges were one at a time. As each challenge came up, the key, the real key to this was that I had the students on my side. The teachers started to move in the direction that I was moving in, and the parents were on my side. So when things started to get heated, uh, community members would come to the school board and say, 
we should fire that teacher, then the students would show up and the parents would show up and they would say, what a wonderful activity that they, their students or their kids had been involved in. The students would do the same, uh, but slowly but surely, the district recognized that they couldn't they couldn't really go after me because it was too much support for me. Uh huh. And uh, I know you have a couple of your colleagues here. Uh, oh yes. Uh, maybe you could introduce. I, I'd like you to introduce them, and maybe they could introduce themselves a little and their role in this work. Oh sure. Well. First, I'll introduce Aaron Ike, a longtime colleague. When I when he first started teaching, he would come into my class every day and observe, because it was very student centered, and he did that all the way through. First, it was observation, and then we would team teach every day, oh, cool. and eventually, yeah, it was really cool because he's he's one of the brightest teachers that have come across the pipe. Uh, it was quite an honor, but then he started to to chaperone, participate in some of the activities with the kids that were after school. And slowly but surely, he grew into the role of being an advisor to the kids to the point where when I left, he took over th th those activities. Mm -hmm. um, many of the things that the, I work with, eventually he became president of the building for the union and I moved into the role of just working as an advisor for yes, but we would team teach or we would team up with the union, with the kids. We kept that link. We kept that link going and it built strength with both groups. Uh, but Ike, do you want to say, say some words? Uh, sure, I'll say a few things. Um, so the, the, what I want to concentrate on just real quick is the, where is it? The first, the thrive. Just speak real slowly. I will speak slower. Uh, as a, as a teacher, sometimes you feel like you have to get a lot done in a short time. So I, so I might speak a little fast sometimes. So I will just uh, slow down a little bit. And uh, I want to concentrate on the title of the book, Thriving. So there's a couple options for a teacher when they are not teaching. And it could be the lunchroom, it could be the teacher's lounge, it could be uh, uh, a different classroom. And so I found that when uh, a lot of times when I started, when teachers were on their own, it was a lot of, um, uh, they were good people, but they would uh, vent. There was a lot of venting, if you will. And I found it uh, exhausting. And they, like I said, I'm not trying to talk bad, but I found it exhausting. So I found myself in Al's room uh, and it was a place of hope. And it was a place of, of, of uh, intellectualism and growth. And for me, as well as the kids. So I observed him for years and found that he didn't have the same venting issues that the other teachers had. He was really enjoying his work. And so I thought, I'm, I'm hooking up with this guy. You know, I'm gonna stay close to him because I wanna love my work too. So it wasn't until uh, in Wisconsin we had a law passed called Act 10. They called it Act 10 when they passed it. It was a law to disrupt uh, the uh, public sector unions in the state of Wisconsin. So that is when I, I bought in 100% uh, because uh, the teachers in uh, Racine uh, were dizzy with fear. And um, Al came to me and said, we can be more powerful than we've ever been if we do what I'm saying, which is to say, get the union with the parents, with the kids, with the general community who cares, and we can win. And we started winning. We really did. And um, so I'm, I'm a full-fledged follower of the philosophy laid out in the book that he called Thriving. And now I've been teaching five years without him, and I feel great. So yeah. we're back right now. We're sitting in a, I just want to, one more thing. We're sitting in a 100 degree classroom uh, with dust in the air and construction going wild. Uh, the school is kind of in chaos and people keep coming to me uh, because they know that I have a calm hand about these things and that they're, I uh, uh, am driven by solutions. You know, how do we fix these things? How do we move together? And so while you're organizing, uh, while you're just teaching, you're isolated. 
But when you're organizing and teaching, I think you can fully be your human self. And so I, I feel good in my career. I appreciate what he brought to me. And so I'm helping push these ideas out uh, even further if I can. Thanks, Aaron. And you're, you want to introduce your other colleague here? I'll do it. I just want to say, Aaron is much smarter than I am. <laughs> All right, so thank you for the words, Aaron. This is Tanya, Tanya Chavez. Um, she's a YES alumni. She graduated 2020, a year after I stopped teaching. Um, she really was somebody that wasn't really in the forefront of leadership with the students, but she can talk to you about what, what she's gotten out of, you know, out of the activities, out of this, the class. But Thanks, Tanya. Hi. Um, yeah, so I joined, I joined YES my sophomore year of high school and I'm a DACA recipient. So I, so it was a big deal for me, you know? Um, so DACA recipient is um, Deferred Action of Childhood Arrivals. Um, and so it, per, it gives me a driver's license and a social security um, number. And that's about it. You can't do much with it. Can't even get a loan with it. I got, I didn't even really fully understand that until recently that I got rejected from one. Um, but it honestly changed, it, it did change my life, you know, um, being involved in ES. It opened my eyes to a lot of issues that were going on in my own community that not even I knew about. And it made me understand, it made me understand it deeper in a deeper way. And I mean, it made me come back after four years. So, and like Al said, um, I was very quiet in high school, very, I would, but I would always show up, you know, I was, wouldn't really participate. I would only hear. And then four years later, I'm back and I'm ready to be heard, you know, cause um, the situation of everything right now is just not okay. And um, I really do appreciate Al for holding space for the communities, the Latino, African-American communities, because he held space and people felt safe and heard. And I'm one of those people. When I, I was so shy, like super shy, and this really got me out of my shell. You know, I, I always say, I don't know what I'm passionate for. Like, I don't really have any passions. This is my passion, you know? Like, I got a little glimpse of it in high school, and I just can't get enough now. The power you feel when you're surrounded by people who go through the same struggles that you didn't even realize, you know, because at home they tell you, oh, don't speak up, you know, you're gonna put yourself in danger. But that's one of the worst things you can do. You're putting yourself in danger by not speaking out. And yep. I'll help space for more than just me. And I know this is, um, so many people feel like this too. And I really found my community, you know, and this makes you want to grow even more. And you're surrounded by people so knowledgeable that just make you want to learn more and more. Like, it makes you hungry, you know, hungry for, for justice and not just for yourself, but for others. Because then it starts opening, your eyes start opening to other issues, not just yours. And we're all human at the end of the day, you know, like at the end of the day, we bleed the same. It is what it is. Like, it's just injustice that I don't stand for. And I do have, you know, and Ike as well. I've, I, um, I had him as a teacher in high school. He's a very smart man, like Levy says, like, and the, the relationship that these men built, build with their, with the students is just, it, they really are one of a kind teachers that you don't really find that stick with you for the rest of your life, you know? Like I, I stayed in contact with and Levy too, you know? And it's just this beautiful connection that they have with the community. When I go out with either, either one of them to have breakfast, 10 people stop them from the community. Hey dude, what's up? You know, they just, and I love to see it because that's what it's all about, community. After, after all, you know, you don't have much except for family and community, the people you surround yourself with. And that's what it's all about. And they really opened my eyes to that. And I am very, very grateful that I got to see that in this lifetime 
because it's very rare. It really is. And well, yeah. One of the things I hope the book will do, Thriving in Public Schools, is make that less rare. So the question I would have for really all of you, uh, what advice or suggestions would you have to someone who's in another public school? They could be in California or Wisconsin or Texas, and they want to do more uh, kind of what you're doing, learning by doing. What would you suggest sort of for first steps, second steps, if someone is doing this and Aside from reading your book, Thriving in Public Schools, which I've read a couple times very carefully and recommended it, uh, what would you suggest to someone who's a teacher and they're starting out, or maybe they've been there 10, 20 years even, and yeah. they uh, awesome. want to do something more effective? What, what, what is like the first step you would suggest they do? And then, So that's a really, that's an important question. And my mother answered that question. <laughs> my mother was a teacher. She taught social studies. I know, right. And she was loved. It's in the book. You read it. Yeah. And I, the big thing, when I started to teach, she said, Alan, I'm going to tell I, would you like to know the success of being a, a good teacher? And I said, of course. She said, Alan, put your students first and subject matter second. He said, if you do that, she said, then it's you have a beautiful career. And I guess the way that translates is, as new teachers, we're, it's almost like we're in a horse race, trying to get out information, trying to get kids almost like missionaries. And you have to flip it. You have to actually listen to the students. You have to take time to listen to the students and listen to your colleagues. What is important? So how do you, you know, do that? You... Let's say you're a social studies teacher in uh, Keokuk, Iowa, you know, and you got 25, maybe even 30 kids in a class. A lot of uh, how do you actually it starts... what? <laughs> it starts from day one. No, I, I get day... it. I, I've been right, a high school teacher. I mean, what? what how do you listen ingredients. to the students? How do you uh, how I'm do you listen you... to them and make the relationship first? What do you actually do? I'm standing right, up in front of them and we got to teach the Civil War or whatever. What do I do? All right. The first thing I do is before I teach the Civil War, in my classroom, what I would do is, in a, is I would first, the first day, I would tell the kids, I want you to get to know your, each other and I want you to get to know me. Okay. So for me, what I would do is I would walk to every student and shake their hand and introduce myself and ask them a little bit about themselves. And they would tell me. And I would do that with every single student. And I would ask them, well, how do you say your name? And they would tell me. I'd say, well, I know it, but you know I'm going to forget. That's my weakness. So when I do, be patient. So the first thing is you introduce yourself. The second thing is I would do is I would pass around note cards. And I would say, I would like to know, and don't put your name on it, everything you know about me. You know, as a new teacher, first year, that's hard, but they would still do it. But I didn't do that till my second or third year. But and so they would give them, they would fill these note cards with things that they heard. So I would take the note cards and I would read them, every single thing. And then I would say, okay, um, this is true. Yes, this is how I do that. And this is why I do that. And this is so. That, so you're building this relationship with these kids. And I would, for me, I would have like a, a PowerPoint that would have the main ideas of what, what they were going to learn. And I would get their input. You know, I would feel them out as to how they felt about what they were going to learn, how they were going to learn. I would always ask them, how do you want to learn this? And how do you so, do would, that? Do you do that verbally or do you ask them to verbally. write verbally? I would do, I'm a verbal person. And a lot of the kids today, it, they'll, they'll get on their little cell phones and things and they'll kind of dodge around. But I would kind of like, they would be on edge a little bit because I'd ask them, I'd say, you're Victor, right, Victor? What do you think? What do you think about that picture? What do you see in that picture? I'd have them write it down too, but it would be to start this camaraderie with the kids. Right. Um, and then at, no matter what the subject, you can tie every subject 
to social justice. And let me just interrupt you. Uh, you talked about a lot of people are on their cell phones walking across the street. Do you allow cell phones in school? I know some schools are trying to ask people to put their cell phones in a, uh, well, you know, not, not bring them into right. class. What, what's the, what's year, your advice there? Um, I, I don't worry about, for, for me, I mean, I know it's, the policy has changed this year. They want to introduce cell phones are being very uh, mechanical about it. Um, they're valuable tools, but I ignored it. I literally ignored if they had a cell phone because I felt if I can engage these kids, I'm much more interesting. Their colleagues or their, the other kids are much more interesting than what's going on in that cell phone. Yeah. And I would say at some point we would go outside, you know, we would take the classroom out of the classroom. So uh, it's, it's activity. You have to treat it like it's not just broad routine. It's like it's a living, breathing organism, your classroom. Yeah. And, the, and it has to be connected to the community, connected to their parents. Can, if you can make all these connections, yes, yeah, some kids are going to be on their cell phone. And then the other thing that I would do personally is – I didn't go, like uh, Aaron talked about, you know, people griping and they go to the teacher's lounge and they, it's kind of like a place where they can recharge. What I would do, I would just walk the halls, shake every kid's hand, say, hi, how you doing? I knew every kid, not by their name, but then in the lunchroom, I would sit with the kids, different groups. You'd sit with the with kids the in the lunchroom, right? Yeah. What okay. are your issues? And then once they started to organize, I would help the kids organize. I would help train them how you talk to your fellow kids in the in the lunchroom. Okay. And we would go and we go. Sometimes we had uh, five, six hundred kids from Portland go on activities. Right. We only have and, a couple minutes left. So uh, before we close, I wonder if you could just say like one or at the most two things of advice that you would suggest. You know, just to always remember. If I'm a teacher in that school teaching whatever, and I have, what do you have, like 45-minute periods in most schools or something? You want to take it? I, what was your question? What, what are two things that you would advise for new teachers? Yeah. Um, jo join the union. You have to join the union. The union is not perfect, and that's, but that's the first step of joining a community. And saying, I'm not here as an individual, I'm here as a larger community, I want to engage that community, and I want to have build the capacity of that community. And then the second thing is, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how to say it um, um, exactly, but you, you really do, <laughs> you have to, uh, um, don't sweat the small stuff. And 89% of it is small stuff. Uh, you know, the dust on my desk is small stuff, you right. know. Uh, uh, yes, helped win a, a, a referendum for a billion dollars. We're getting air conditioning next year, you know. Right. So it's like, so, so, in, so it's, uh, uh, it's don't sweat the small stuff, join the union. And that's the, for a first year teacher, that those would be two critical pieces. Okay, I that's great. Well, I, I just really appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, Alan and Aaron and Tanya. Alan uh, Levy is the author of, let's see that book, Thriving in Public Schools. Uh, I've, uh, it's upside down. <laughs> uh, I've read this book. It's a great example of with specific things that uh, Alan has done and the students have done and other teachers have done. And it's, uh, it's a great book. I'd encourage you to get it. It's available wherever books are sold. Uh, it's available in your library. Thriving in Public Schools by Alan Levy, uh, L-E-V-I-E, -E, uh, who's been a veteran teacher in uh, Racine, Wisconsin. So I want to thank you, Alan and Aaron and Tanya, for coming on We Hold These Truths. Thank you so much. Thank you. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.